Traditionally, horror isn't a genre that depends on digital trickery. Taking a practical approach is often not only cheaper, but more effective when it comes to unnerving an audience. And horror movies rarely enjoy the freedom of a big budget, especially when the big studios aren't involved. Advances in technology in recent years have made convincing visual effects far more accessible, however, to the point that even low-budget productions can take advantage. Green screens are now commonplace on horror sets, and if you strip away all the special effects, what you're left with isn't very scary at all. Hollow Man Paul Verhoeven's Hollow Man fell well short of recouping the $95 million production budget at the domestic box office, and it took a hammering in the media, with 27% on Rotten Tomatoes. But even the harshest critics of the film admitted that the special effects were impressive. Verhoeven told DVD Talk, We really tried to link the special effects shots with the actors as much as possible. We wanted coherence between the special effects and the actors so people would accept the effects as part of the actor's scene. Jerome Chen, senior VFX supervisor at Sony Pictures Imageworks, told FX Guide, That film was all done with rotomation off the performance of Kevin Bacon. No motion capture, just hard thousands of hours of labor. The Ring Gore Verbinski's box office smash The Ring kick-started Hollywood's obsession with Japanese horror during the mid-2000s. Naomi Watts plays a Seattle journalist who's investigating an urban legend about a videotape that kills anyone who watches it in seven days. When her son unwittingly pops said tape into their VHS player, the pair are haunted by Samara, who crawls out of a well and straight through the television. But the look of the vengeful ghost was the in-camera work of special effects makeup artist Rick Baker. He said, I think the scariest thing about Samara uh, for me, anyways, it's not knowing what's under that hair. Crimson Peak Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water marks a return to form for the director, whose 2015 gothic romance Crimson Peak tanked hard at the box office. The latter relied on what VFX supervisor Chris McLean called practical hybrids for the most part, mixing green screen with creature builds. One example can be seen towards the end of the movie when Edith has a farewell moment with Thomas and her fingers pass right through his face. The Conjuring 2 James Wan's The Conjuring, in 2013, was the first film in what would later evolve into a shared movie universe encompassing the Annabelle series, as well as The Nun and The Crooked Man. Visual effects artist David Ridlin worked on a few shots for the first Conjuring movie, rendering some everyday items that you probably didn't realize were CGI, including the scariest bedsheet ever. VFX artist Didier Konings was hired to take care of the little details in 2016's The Conjuring 2, removing security cameras and altering buildings to make the 1970s set look authentic. The Thing On action, the beast comes forward, it's gonna be on fire! Action! A prequel to John Carpenter's 1982 horror classic of the same name, 2011's The Thing follows the plight of a doomed group of scientists who discover a living alien buried deep in a block of Antarctic ice. Now how does this motherfucker wake up after thousands of years in the ice? The film's VFX supervisor, Jesper Klovesvrid, described his process to the art of VFX, saying, As the teeth of the alien mouth rip the skin, we see the inside tentacles push through while Juliet's head is forced towards her back. Gross. Godzilla Director Gareth Edwards landed on Hollywood's radar with his visually impressive low-budget breakout Monsters in 2010. And the following year, he was offered the job of rebooting Godzilla. Edwards was initially concerned that signing on for a Hollywood blockbuster meant he would have to relinquish control to a certain extent, but the studio's reaction to the first teaser trailer he cut put his mind at ease. He told FX Guide, I just wanted to do what I thought would give me goosebumps. Edwards brought in VFX house MPC to make the trailer, and they went on to render several set pieces in the final film, including Godzilla causing havoc in San Francisco Bay. The Shallows Survival horror thriller The Shallows seemed to come out of nowhere in 2016, going certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. The predator stalking Blake Lively throughout the film was created by brilliantly named Important Looking Pirates, a Swedish VFX house that specialize in sharks. Visual effects supervisor Scott E. Anderson told FSR, Most animals, sharks included, are designed to blend into the environment. Our job is to use visibility selectively to meet the needs of the film and direct the audience and I when we want or need to. The Purge – Election Year Visual effects veteran James Haddon has worked on countless horror franchises over the years, but none have been quite as timely as 2016's The Purge – Election Year. Thanks to Haddon's company VFX Legion, viewers were able to experience another frightening night on the lawless streets of a bleak near-future America. Though for the actors involved, many of those scenes were created in post. According to Haddon, his priority on a project like this one is delivering value for money. He told Frightfind, 
Horror movies do not have huge budgets, and so the idea that CG is going to be in your horror movie? It's really hard to do because they're not funded to do that. Haddon went on to explain that it's his personal policy to make sure that any shots his company is responsible for don't look cheap, even if they are cheap by blockbuster standards, adding, My goal in delivering shots out of VFX Legion to the world is that they should not bump in the cut. Prometheus A number of VFX houses worked on Ridley Scott's 2012 return to the Alien franchise, including MPC, Fuel VFX, Luma Pictures, and Weta Digital. The New Zealand-based company was tasked with rendering the film's new race of giant humanoid extraterrestrials, which involved digitally enhancing the on-set performance of a costumed actor. What as VFX supervisor Martin Hill said, Usually, we would strive to make a digi character as anatomically accurate as possible in terms of its musculature, articulation, and the thickness and pliability of the fat under the skin. We had to make some compromises to match an actor in silicone prosthetics. Designing the look of the engineers was a job that fell to concept artist Neville Page. He told Wired that when Scott first approached him, the director envisioned the engineers as a mixture between some well-known statues and one legendary musician. Page said Scott had specific metaphors in mind for the artist, telling Wired, I was looking at reference of Statue of Liberty, the Michelangelo sculptures, uh, specifically David, and Oddly, Elvis Presley. World War Z When he sat down to discuss his team's achievements with Wired, World War Z visual effects supervisor Scott Farrar explained that it was always their intention to break from the traditional zombie mold with this movie. They went with a scientific approach, reckoning that a real virus of this nature would make humans fast, vicious, and relentless. The biggest example is the epic moment when 8,500 computer-animated zombies pile on top of each other to breach the walls of Israel. Farrar said, The single hardest thing about that was just making those piles look right without something going wrong. You're always battling with what looks good and cool in a movie and still feels real. You can look at these shots every day for months and then all of the sudden you're almost ready to go to final and somebody will spot something that's wrong in the shot. It's like, where's Waldo? While CGI clearly played a massive part in bringing this world to life, animation director Andrew Jones favored a mixture of computer graphics and practical performances hiring talented contortionists who could mimic the semi-possessed look they were going for. Krampus To promote their work on the 2015 Christmas horror movie Krampus, Weta released a mock interview with the film's chief gingerbread handler, who claimed, Working with the gingerbread man on set was a real challenge. They were easily startled, fragile, and really skittish. In reality, they were one of the smaller challenges Weta faced on the project, which was approached in a largely practical fashion for sake of nostalgia. Weta Workshop co-founder Richard Taylor said, This is a classic 80s monster movie. This is fantastic stuff. This is what we live for. This is what gets us up in the morning. From the animatronic cherub that attacks Tony Collette in the attic to the terrifying jack-in-the-box operated from inside by three puppeteers, Krampus minions were as ingenious as they were unnerving, and none more so than the anti-claws himself. The titular demon was portrayed by Luke Hawker, who wore a custom-made costume complete with hoof stilts and prosthetic finger extensions. He said of the heavy suit, Your muscles are just burning and you're sweating and you're thinking, am I going to throw up? And then Mike comes in and his, the smile on his face just says it all. I am legend. The Will Smith-led adaptation of Richard Matheson's seminal zombie novel I Am Legend did pretty well with the critics and didn't disappoint at the box office, but it's widely accepted that the CGI sucked. The film was fast-tracked into production before a script had even been completed, and the schedule started to get backed up when the practical creature effects looked terrible on camera. The decision was made to render the undead digitally, though in reality there was never enough time to make them look convincing. Director Francis Lawrence told Den of Geek, it was better than doing the live versions at that time because it didn't work, but we needed six more months on the post end to get all the visual effects right, because there were some close-ups that were stunning, and then you get some shots that I never got right, and it just kills it. One of the big downfalls for me with that movie personally was with the visual effects. VFX supervisor Yannick Sears told AWN that the animators were still redesigning the creatures during post-production to match the, quote, continually evolving nature of the film. Deadly Honeymoon Even if you consider yourself a true gorehound, chances are you've never heard of Deadly Honeymoon. This low-budget TV movie from 2010 probably would have flown under the radar altogether had it not been based on true events that took place five years earlier. 
a story that grabbed news headlines and became the subject of a Dateline report. In 2005, newlywed George Smith and his bride Jennifer set sail on their dream honeymoon cruise, though only one of them would survive. The groom simply vanished one night, a mystery that has never been solved. Lifetime adapted the story into a television feature, changing the names and creating their own explanation. They cast Summer Glau in the role of wife-turned-widow Lindsay, which was a dream come true according to the actress. She told My San Antonio, I've wanted to do a Lifetime movie since I was a little girl. It's a really good way for girls to get challenging dramatic roles. Her faith in the network was rewarded when they hired an experienced VFX crew to turn the set into the open ocean. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.